we have uh, Kat, who's in Western Australia. Kiki, who you're in Sydney? I'm actually up in Queensland. Oh, uh, okay. The, the beauty of the internet, right? Beauty of the internet. Be anywhere. Yeah. And, and Kate, who's in Sydney. Um, so I'll just keep an eye on things. But um, I think that we might actually get started um, because I'm quite sure more people will join as we go. So kia ora koutou katoa, uh, no mai haere mai ki te hui o tēnā wā, uh, uh, aku nui aku rahi, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Um, kia ora, uh, ko Liz McPherson ahau, uh, ko uh, koi hana tuarua ki te tare o te mana mata pono mata tapu in I &A. Um, so welcome everybody to this Privacy Week webinar. Um, my name is Liz McPherson. I am the Deputy Privacy Commissioner here at the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. And it is my real pleasure to welcome you all here today, but particularly to welcome our Wahini Tour, this amazing panel that we have um, to talk to us today about advocacy and the importance of advocacy in the privacy ecosystem. Um, so we're joined by... Kat Gledel Tucker uh, and Kiki Fong Lim and Kate Bauer. And I feel somewhat let out, left out here, being Liz, um, amongst the sort of the case that we have going on here. Um, what I'm going to ask you to, the, and, and I just, just a little bit more about the, the topic today. Um, this came out of a trip that I took to Australia um, not so long ago. Uh, in the aftermath of all of the big data breaches. And, and I uh, attended a, a conference and on the stage I saw um, uh, the, the woman that we have in front of us and other advocates advocating for um, the rights of Australians in the, particularly the digital um, uh, rights space. And, and I asked myself the question, we, we have advocates here in New Zealand, but um, we they don't seem to we don't seem to have as many, um, and does it say something about our advocacy culture here in New Zealand? What is it about um, Australia that you know maybe you've got some secret sauce over there? But in particular, what I wanted to do was explore what it takes to be an advocate, um, because speaking as the privacy regulator, it's important for us to have friends out there. Um, and we know that there are people out there in, um, in New Zealand who are concerned about their privacy rights, but not, might not feel comfortable about speaking up. Um, and so from our perspective, it's the, the, the privacy advocates, the, the, um, the digital rights advocates are critically important. So I'm just going to ask um, our panellists to very briefly introduce themselves. And then we're going to start to hear a little bit more about how they got to where they got to and what their journey was like to get there. So, um, Kat, you're at the top of my screen. Do you want to start? Sure, thank you. And Kaya, hello, everybody. It's lovely to see you all. Oh, well, I can see numbers uh, and very few faces, but I'm Catherine Gladhill Tucker. Cat's fine. I'm a Noongar technologist, writer, and digital rights activist. And I have very recently joined Digital Rights Watch as a campaigns and advocacy manager. Kiki, uh, you're muted currently, Kiki. I am, thank you. Uh, so I am also a sexual academic and my students will tell you I love to meet myself all the time. It's probably not a bad thing. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I actually tutor ethics in uh, cybersecurity and digital forensics as my day job, but I am also on the board as uh, Vice Chair of Electronic Frontiers Australia, uh, so EFA, and uh, the Internet Society Chapter of Australia, so Internet Australia. Um, kia ora, kia ora, and Kate. 
Hello, everybody, and um, thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here on the panel with all these awesome advocates and uh, also an awesome regulator. Um, my name is Kate Bauer. I am a reformed academic, so I just want people to know that's not a necessary requirement of becoming a privacy advocate. Um, but my current role is consumer data advocate at Choice, um, which is Australia's largest consumer um, organisation and a sister organisation of Consumer NZ that I hopefully your audience is familiar with. Um, be very familiar with and actually the, um, the, the CEO of Consumer New Zealand used to be, um, I took over his role here at, at um, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. So um, know him very, very well and people here in New Zealand would too. So um, I want to start off by hearing a little bit about how you got to where you got to. What was your own personal journey to becoming an advocate? Um, and I'll start again with you, Kat, at the top of the screen. Okay, I'll try to keep this brief. Um, it feels like I have a bit of a long and winding journey into advocacy. Uh, so my professional background is in the tech industry. I've been working in tech for a little over a decade, and I've worked on software product and platform teams, and I spent a few years working as a software consultant. Um, and I also spent time managing programs to help the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders build successful careers in tech. Mm -hmm. So my early career days were in marketing and analytics. So I really got to peer behind the curtain of surveillance capitalism and see how it worked both at the level of the machine and the computer and at scale on an enterprise level and see the breadth of exploitation of people's data. And that really radicalized me at the time. So it was at that point that I became just so acutely aware of how there is this enormous power imbalance between tech companies and platforms and the people who engage with them. So it was around this time that I became more engaged with the digital rights movement in Australia, both as a member of civil society organizations and also trying to teach as many people around me as I could about good privacy measures that you can take as an individual. Mm -hmm. um, and I started working with other Indigenous technologists in uh, Indigenous protocols in artificial intelligence and learning more about embedding protocols of Indigenous data sovereignty and data governance into my work. I also worked really hard to encourage good privacy and security habits in the development teams that I was working with to build better cultures of respect for individual privacy and negotiate those priorities between product teams and marketing and security and, and privacy who don't always get along. So that's, that's my that's my journey. Right, okay. Thank you so much, Kate. And um, just for um, everybody listening, um, one of the things I didn't say at the beginning of the session is um, we will have time for questions and answers. If you do have some questions, please, um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see the, the um, Q&A box, pop them in there. Don't put them in the chat box. That's not where we'll be looking. We'll be looking at the in the Q&A section. So um, we will leave time for questions at the end. Um, so Kiki, in your bio, um, which we posted on our website, you described yourself as a reluctant advocate. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Oh, so earlier I said I am on the board of uh, EFA and uh, the Internet Society. And I've done some other uh, advocacy in the uh, on-ground community sector. Uh, I guess I'd say I'm reluctant because I don't actually want to be doing uh, some of the things that I dedicate to the act of advocacy. My family would love it if I uh, could be doing other things. My friends would love it if I could join them on some things that I often, uh, you know, decline. And certainly... My GP would love it if I could get out and walk some more, but I am tied to the computer. So I guess for me, uh, much like Kat, um, probably less technical, uh, another lifetime ago, I was a search engine optimization consultant and I went to purge my soul um, and absolve myself uh, by moving into the frontline community sector. Um, as luck would have it at that time, uh, I think it was about 2012, if I recall now, um, in Queensland, we had a particular government uh, in play, the Newman government, who introduced all these clauses for uh, health and community sector organisations that mm -hmm. they couldn't undertake advocacy. Um, and if they did, they would no longer be eligible for that funding. 
Um, and so I got involved with uh, a bit of a project called the Coalition of Community Boards, uh, and it was a it was a movement to uh, work together to strengthen the sector, uh, to advocate um, for the place of community organisations, um, but also around uh, resource sharing and things like that, which we'll talk about later on. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's through that I then ended up. Uh, we have uh, what's called uh, the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So that came in uh, over a transition period. Um, well, how long ago was that now, Kate? Okay, that was uh, a few years ago now. So coming on 10 years when it started. Um, and the NDIS is controversial, it still is. I'd highly recommend uh, checking out Marie Johnson's work uh, on that. But there was a number of things there with both the digital platform um, the program itself um, and how individual rights were being contravened and their privacy from service providers. Uh, one of the uh, big data breaches uh, that occurred before um, our shared latitude breach and <laughs> Medibank yep. and Optus, Optus was one called CTARS, uh, I think around mm -hmm. 12,000. Uh, people with disability were uh, had their identity breached and posted on a forum. Uh, very little, um, very little discussion around that. And I think um, around around that, I was also doing individual advocacy for people um, in different forums. Uh, and I had I had um, an experience with one individual who said to me, "I was an advocate," as in they were an advocate. Uh, but I can't go to these places anymore because of the injuries. And so I need you to know if you're there, if you're in the room mm -hmm. and someone's supposed to be speaking up, but they're not. Uh, I want you to speak up. I want you to promise me that you just speak up if you're in that room. And so I guess that's what I've been doing. Uh, I just keep finding myself in rooms where I hope people will speak up and, and not that that's always intentional. Um, and not that I'm always right. I mean, certainly I've spoken up and gone, God, what a fool. Um, but I'd rather be a fool. Um, and I guess that's where the reluctance comes in. I am not a professional. My work in EFA and, um, and the Internet Australia is voluntary. Um, a lot of my other community uh, board work is voluntary. Um, but it's important. Um, and I think that you know, CTARS in particular is an example where you shouldn't have to wait till it happens to you or your family. You know, people people really do need us to um, speak up, have that conversation uh, and change our, our broader social kind of understanding of things. Um, so here I am, you know, uh, even as <laughs> taking ethics classes, I joke uh, with the university because I too am not actually an academic. Um, I just happen to be there. Uh, and we do joke that, you know, I'm of a certain age and, you know, having being a loose unit with a big mouth <laughs> uh, seems to be a prerequisite to uh, teaching ethics now. So uh, that that's kind of where I came to. So it's a little odd journey, but um, a, a lot of individual interactions, I think, of people that have influenced me and, and, and put me to this spot. Fine. OK. So what about you, Kate? I just absolutely love the description of loose unit with a big mouth. Loose I'm sure. With a big mouth, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that some people have also described me like that. In fact, I might put it on my CV because um, <laughs> I think that's an excellent descriptor of what an advocate is. Um, you do need to be a little bit of a troublemaker. I'm in the incredibly fortunate position that uh, being an advocate is my job. Um, mm -hmm. One of the fantastic things about being part of a consumer advocacy organisation um, is exactly that, that you get paid to do this work. And so much of um, the work of privacy advocates and digital rights advocates is volunteer, um, which I think can be a bit of a, a barrier to getting into um, advocacy. Um, it's funny, I, yeah, I kind of had a, a different um, I guess, activation moment in the sense I've always been interested in social justice uh, back in my former life as an academic. Um, my PhD was actually around possibilities of feminist scholarship and I was kind of interested in how do we make change through intellectual knowledge and through the production of scholarship. 
Um, and the long story of how I decided to leave academia, it could fill up a whole webinar, so I won't go into it. Um, but I was fortunate enough to find myself a job at Choice and I did a few different kind of roles there. I did things like fact checking. I also worked in technology and product building, similar to Kat, probably a bit less uh, technical than her advanced skills. Um, but, you know, I certainly got to see some of those things like, um, you know, agile product development and SEO and, and those sorts of practices, um, probably not at that kind of enterprise level. But then Choice had an interesting uh, a kind of entry into how we got into this space. So back in 2021, um, the board um, kind of suggested to for the executive to look into where do we think that harms will be happening to consumers now and into the future? Like where are the emerging areas of harm that we need to start thinking about? Um, and off the back of that, um, they created a new team um, that was to be centred around data misuse. So data misuse was kind of identified as a whole of economy harm that would require a, some a kind of an upskilling and a certain amount of um, advocacy that we should develop. Um, and I kind of put my hand up to join that team. Um, and I guess it was through that process of taking it up as a job that I kind of became activated as a, um, a privacy and digital rights activist because... Um, the more you know, um, I think the more engaged you are to want to um, to do something and to advocate um, on this issue. So I can very much kind of relate to Kiki and, and Kat's stories there, even though we've got very different entryways in. Um, I think the more that you kind of peek behind the curtain and the more that you learn about some of the practices are happening and the way that um, the social exclusion um, that is happening um, and certainly just a, a kind of a giant uh, amassing of certain power, corporate power, um, and really some really large scale effects um, that really affect both individuals and society as a whole. Um, it's really impossible not to become an advocate, I think, which is I can understand why Kiki uh, forgoes family events to do the advocacy work because uh -huh. sometimes it's really, really hard to um, close the laptop at the end of the day. Yeah, no, I would agree. And uh, there's, you know, the, 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 the activation moment that basically seized each of you um, really does seem to, to basically come down to getting a real glimpse of what the lived experiences of people um, out there who are impacted by, by um, a lack of rights or um, exclusion or what have you. Um, I, uh, I was interested, um, before we started the session, I was having a chat with Kiki and she was making the point that, um, that uh, it appears that, um, that your sort of your ordinary everyday Australian, if you want to put it that way, has become more interested in this space since the very big data breaches, um, and that um, uh, and that you know uh, the 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 CETAS breach that you were mentioning, Kiki, um, didn't really attract much attention at all. Um, uh, do you want to um, talk a bit about that, Kate? I think that um, that that Kiki mentioned that you'd seen some research in that space. Um, yeah, uh, the CTAS breach was super, super interesting. I think Choice is one of the few um, outlets that covered it um, and it really didn't get a lot of um, traction um, compared to when we then saw the the Optus and, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, Medibank, I was going to say Medicare, that's not right. Hopefully Medicare is not breached. Medibank <laughs> um, afterwards. Um, but in terms of um, Choice has been tracking um, consumer sentiments over concern about data for a number of years now since we started the team back in 2021. Um, and we did see a pretty serious spike in concern um, following those data breaches. Um, and it, I would say um, it's actually softens a, a teeny bit in our, in our life. We do this quarterly. Um, but previously, you know, the number of people who had trust in the businesses were trading their data responsibly had got down to like less than one in 10. So less than 10% um, of people felt that businesses were using their, collecting and using their data um, responsibly. So I think there has been a really significant shift in how um, people are understanding this issue. And I think more people individually are being activated by the fact that they're now being directly affected. I think the fact that particularly in Australia that 
Optus and Medibank um, happened so quickly in succession um, and that many people, like this is the second largest telco and the, the largest health insurer, um, mm -hmm. would have literally just replaced their licence um, or their identity documents from one and then next month were hit by another one, mm -hmm. um, really did make people realise just how um, pertinent this was, which as a privacy advocate, that's almost fantastic news. Like, I mean, you don't want to be happy about those sorts of things happening, but you almost kind of kind of wait for these moments where there is like a big kind of zeitgeist change. Um, the trick is how to keep that level of interest uh, yeah. going um, without having to kind of have a scandal every six months just to remind people this is a, this is a problem. Yeah, which leads into my next question, which is around, you know, what do you think it takes to, to be a successful advocate or an advocacy organisation? You know, um, what do you need to, to, what is the secret source to be able to keep that influence, keep the, the, um, uh, the, the interest going? Um, uh, because when I, mean, I know here in New Zealand, for example, um, we often think, you know, here at the regulator, you know, the, the people are going to get really concerned about this particular issue. It's really impacting um, a lot of people out there. Um, but, um, you know, uh, uh, New Zealanders are, can be a, a fairly complacent lot in terms of, as, in, as consumers. And so it really takes something that's right, um, uh, you know, probing them that, uh, and, and um, pushing their buttons personally before they'll do anything about it. So, what does it take to be a successful advocate? Um, Kat? I think it's a big question and maybe uh, what it takes to be a successful advocate and what it takes to be a successful advocacy organisation are two different things. Yeah, I think that um, uh, I suppose like when it comes to advocacy on an individual level, I really think that everyone can be an advocate and there is a place for everybody and advocacy can take many forms and it's not just these kind of organized and coordinated long-term campaigns centered around a particular issue whether that is in response to data breaches or we're talking about uh, specific privacy concerns or surveillance concerns or biometric surveillance um, for example but it it might be some people make zines and TikToks or music or they teach their friends how to have better privacy controls on their phone or you teach your parents to have better privacy controls on your Facebook account. Um, and I, you know, personally, I'm also a writer. I write mostly poetry and science fiction, but I find that creative practice is also an extension of my advocacy and so much of speculative fiction is about predicting the future and considering what could go wrong mm -hmm. and that is a big part of advocacy and activism work as well like we're all actively engaging in a practice of imagining what could go wrong and what needs to change to create the conditions for the kind of world that we want to live in mm -hmm. I think the most important thing is finding ways to make advocacy sustainable in your life as, a, as an individual advocate I think Kate you mentioned um it could, there's like a bit of a barrier for entry into advocacy work. I think it's also just as difficult to maintain kind of longevity in this space as well, I, especially because there is such a huge uh, volunteer component. People can burn out really quickly and that isn't specific to digital rights, but across all social justice movements, I think. Um, I see a lot of people get very passionate and uh, interested in these concerns and really throw themselves into it and burn themselves out and stop going to family events and <laughs> neglecting your personal health. And I think finding a way to make advocacy and activism a sustainable part of your life is really key. And for some people, it's about finding, you know, a group or an organisation of like-minded people who you can organise with and nourish each other and support each other or a campaign that you can contribute to. Um, and I think any scale of advocacy work is, is valuable. Thank you. What about you, Kiki? What do you think? Do yeah, you look, um, I, I think, uh, you know, Kate raised so many, so many good points there. And, and, you know, with my work with both on-ground community organizations and even EFA, I mean, this is our 30th year. 
um, <clears throat> this is not, um, this is, I, I don't even know if I can talk to the characteristics of, of an advocate in the in this kind of space more than Kat and Kate who have been doing this and uh, for a long time and are much more familiar um, with that ecosystem. But there are some similarities there and, and certainly that longevity of, as an organisation and making sure that you don't get co-opted by um, the, the, the competitive tendering nature of funding um, and I'm a big fan of not um, having competitive tendering uh, if you're a funder out there. Um, but uh, trying to, uh, you know, trying to have a supportive and collaborative approach to shared concerns, whether that's your individuals, your friends, your family, your co-workers, or whether it's um, between organisations, uh, you can have differences and still work together um, on, on your shared concerns. And I, I, and I think then, you know, I guess the characteristic there I would say is a willingness uh, and a patience uh, with other people, but with yourself as well. Um, it's okay to say, hey, I'd like to help out. I don't have any, I've, I've got maybe a month um, and I could maybe do even basic administrative stuff uh, or, hey, I'm pretty good with, uh, Photoshop, would you like me to develop some stuff or the classic one that gets, uh, you know, which is a shockingly bad stain on digital rights um, organisations is, oh, your website's a, a, a wee bit out of date. <laughs> I can help you. I can help you with that. Um, or offer to write, you know, offer to write a blog or, or, or something about something that concerned you so that other people know that they're not alone. Um, I, I hear... Um, you know, I really love what you put um, in the title of this panel, which was around the ecosystem. Um, and I think New Zealand's really, uh, and, and I may be wrong, so uh, please correct me if I am, but uh, my understanding is uh, New Zealand has got some pretty good privacy laws. Yeah. Um, you also have uh, an enshrined um, Bill of Human Rights or, or the equivalent, which Australia doesn't have. Um, and so I think being able to look adjacently at avenues for people and to be able to discuss your rights just generally mm -hmm. um, and, and, and just sometimes just to stick up for yourself. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's really important. Um, but, you know, where uh, that's from an organisational caps really outlined individual advocacy and, you know, we all have our own stories uh, and it's okay as well. Like a lot of people, uh, and I'm not sure, but I'm sure New Zealand, it, it seems to be a smaller demographic um, and, <laughs> you know, getting out of family dinners is actually, you know, I may be using it as an excuse because I actually come from a very large family. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll look for any kind of excuse. Um, but, you know, you, you, you actually can just do um, informal advocacy. And so I guess that shared concerns, that listening and willingness, uh, because the robo debt campaign that we had here, although it was not strictly around um, uh, privacy, there was certainly uh, there was certainly a lot. It was privacy that. adjacent, quite differently. Yeah, and and you yeah. know, uh, if people had done that alone, if some people had spoken up, they may not have been in a great position to not feel whether they did or not, um, or would or not, to have some kind of retribution somewhere within their own like personal ecosystem or professional ecosystem. So I think it's good to know that you can do things that if you are able just to share something so that other people know that it's A, safe to do so, to say that they've got a concern, or B, to have a, um, to be open uh, to hearing others um, and getting also permission um, to take that cause uh, for them when they're unable to. Uh, I think that's that's quite important for me personally. I I I, I appreciate that um, there'll be situations, and Robert did is a case in point, and there'll be other occasions as well where the individuals within the organisation are concerned, but don't feel that they can advocate um, um, from their position. Kate, I'm really interested in a point that Kiki was making earlier about um, about uh, the way in which uh, advocacy organisations like your own may um, uh, network, support each other. Um, do, do you do this sort of thing across your, your networks? 
Yeah, I think um, the word ecosystem has been brought up quite a lot here. And I think this the importance of a really strong ecosystem. And I, I mean that in, I guess, the kind of like um, somewhat o organic sense of yeah. reaching out and and coordinating and supporting each other and um, you building on each other's strengths and doing what you can, but also in like a more um, kind of organized sense of it's actually really critically important, I think, to have all sized organizations um, involved in this type of advocacy. Mm -hmm. I think one of the really fascinating things about a large organization comparatively like Choice um, moving into this space has been being able to see what's been possible. Like we've moved into what is a new area for choices and consumer advocacy, and we've got a strong consumer movement um, where we are connected with other consumer organisations um, internationally through Consumers International, but also through um, financial counselling networks and, and legal centres that we would traditionally have relationships with. But it's been really fantastic to also then build collaborative um, relationships with organisations like Digital Rights Watch and EFA, where we would not traditionally have um, those sorts of networks. And I think it's been to, um, you know, raising up all boats to have more people in that space. And I think it's really also significantly important that we do think about like that point about competitive funding. It's, you know, it can, and I saw it happen as well in, in academia, you know, it can really just suck up everyone's time and everyone's life force. And it's just can be so demoralizing to constantly be begging for money. So I think if there's people who are on the call, um, who maybe are interested in supporting advocacy, but don't necessarily want to pursue a role as an advocate, one thing that you can do is encourage your organisation to just give some money to some people who are doing the advocacy work um, and not have it come with a whole bunch, a whole bunch of strings. Um, and, you know, I think it's been a huge... Um, you know, blessing for me and a huge benefit, I think, to the overall movement to have a large organisation like Choice move into that space. And I think it can give like a lot of, um, you know, uh, a lot of air. Um, I don't want to overstate Choice's role in it, but I'm, I'm hoping that that's a fair assessment of um, hopefully getting a bit more airtime for, for the issue more generally. Um, you know, and in that sense too, there's also things that people can do, you know, we're supported a lot behind the scenes by people who are passionate about the subject but because of their role potentially can't do something public facing so I just want to kind of do a special shout out to the number of people working for example in private private um, privacy consultancies yeah. um, who might do things like read a complaint to a regulator who might give us some free legal advice about the specifics of the law that enable us to make a complaint to a regulator or enable us to put it into an invest investigative piece or frame a campaign um, so that when we perhaps don't have that legal expertise, there is like a really fantastic group of people um, who work within corporates and who work within um, privacy agencies who are willing to support us. So I think that's another quiet way of doing advocacy. You don't need to have the big, um, as much as I love the loose unit with a big mouth, <laughs> um, you know, if that's something that you think that you can contribute that knowledge or expertise, um, you know, reach out to one of us, one of us people with the big mouth and we're very <laughs> gladly, um, very gladly be the mouthpiece for some of that really important detailed work that perhaps we don't always have the time or the skills um, to do. And in that sense, um, you know, I guess the, the personal skills to be the kind of public advocate that we have mm -hmm. on the call now, you, you do have have a little bit of, um, I don't know whether it's kind of like naive dogged determination, um, but you have to kind of want to want to get in the fight a little bit, um, yeah. you know, so I think that's not for everyone, um, you know, and certainly uh, people say to me sometimes, you know, if, particularly if I'm going into a situation where I might be going to like a corporate round table or something on yeah. governance and I might be the only civil society representative there and I feel the weight of all 200,000 choice members and every other <laughs> privacy and consumer advocate <laughs> that's not in the room um, on my back and people say, isn't that like intimidating to go in with, you know, the Microsoft or the Atlassian or whoever it is that's at the table um, and I think well yeah but also I have something that don't they don't have and it's that I'm on the right side you know and I think that the moral the moral high ground um, can be like an incredibly powerful force in in trying to um, uh, you know face face down those kind of intimidating situations but I would say yeah and as a personal attribute you probably do need to not mind a, a good fight.
Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I can see from the looks on everybody's faces that you're agreeing with that point. Um, and I think that you certainly have to have that as a regulator as well. Um, the, I'm really interested to hear, because I mean, one of the things that, I mean, obviously as an advocate, advocate you're trying to do is fundamentally um, influence to achieve change, right? Um, to, you know, positive change or to basically, you know, um, uh, work against some significant risk or something that's negative. Um, I'm really interested to hear from each of you just one um, uh, change that you've, you've achieved through your advocacy or your organization's advocacy that you're most proud of. Um, so, Kat, we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, if I can also add on, I'm really glad that we've been talking about the uh, ecosystem of organizations um, because I, I think that is a, a huge strength that we have between all of our organizations and Digital Watch and EFA and Choice have collaborated on uh, you know several successful programs of work, I'd say. And the um, the the strength of the member-based organizations like EFA, I think, can advocate in certain ways that say digital rights watch can't or that choice might not be able to and the kinds of research the choice is able to fund and then we can build on from yeah. a campaign's yeah. perspective i think it's such a, an enormous um benefit uh your question was around i'm so sorry i still have covid brain could you please <laughs> repeat your question right um so it was a change that you've influenced that you're particularly proud of Thank and you. I'm sorry for your COVID brain and, and, and also sorry for Sam Floriani's COVID brain because she's um, unwell and so we're sending her all our positive thoughts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. best of luck and rest up, Sam. Honestly, I think 70% um, of the population has COVID brain at this point, so I, I don't feel too left out. Um, uh, I'd say like on a, an organisation level, maybe a larger scale, I, one of the even just seeing the, the movement grow over the few years that I've been working in digital rights has been really encouraging. Um, and then on a small level, I think there are, there are small wins that keep me going. Like I, I get really encouraged when I work with other activist organisations and teaching them good privacy uh, ways of working, whether it's organizing and coordinating or staying um or keeping keeping information private during a protest even just teaching a friend how to install a pie hole in their local network those are the the kind of small small wins that really keep me going right okay kiki what about you what is but something that you're proud of that you or your organizations achieved i think you might be muted again I don't know how I did that, but uh, I'm awesome like that on the technical stuff. So I can definitely tell you to do advocacy in this space. You don't need to be technical. You can just like <laughs> bat thumb it <laughs> your way through. Um, look, it's a really hard one because uh, electric uh, Electronic Frontiers Australia is it's our thirtieth year this year, mm -hmm. and um, you know so some of the great things have been around all of the work that has happened um, from advocates um, prior uh, and Kat, Kat included, uh, who, who was our outgoing vice chair. Um, and I know the Citizens.Suspects campaign was something, and, and that's how I came into it, and it's been really, really big. Um, Sorry, Kiki, I don't think people in New Zealand will know about that campaign. Okay, so... Well, that was 2014, so I'm thinking if it's our 30th year, it was like that was a 10-year, now we've got another 10 years, so we probably need another big campaign, so maybe like privacy, not privacy, not products or something like that, I don't know, or, yeah. or people, not products, something like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, that, that particular campaign came about in 2014, so that was uh, in response to some proposed legislation, some vague um, data retention, metadata retention um, that the government was trying to enforce uh, for telcos. Uh, so those people who were streaming uh, movies and uh, music off LimeWire, no, I'm just kidding, uh, we all got a bit worried, but yay, TPG, but <laughs> no, that's not true. Um, that... that 
but it was also off the back of the Edward Snowden revelations. And I think, Kate, I can't remember the word that you said before uh, about those big zeitgeist moments or something like that. You know, I think that was that was a particular period of time. Yeah. And I, you know, and 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 you're right. These are these are about um, not having to or capitalizing on those. Um, but those types of moments can be really difficult because uh, I guess recently we had what the doxing. We're going to introduce some doxing stuff in relation to some events that had happened and some other stuff around you know for domestic violence and then we have to do these submissions just because a politician had a whim and wanted to say something so sometimes those like ghost things aren't great um so i guess for me i'm uh, my, my past on ground stuff is around that sustainability uh mm -hmm. for for organizations and adaptability in that really uncertain volatile type of environments mm -hmm. to be able to do that stuff that's the kind of work that i'm doing currently with efa um so hopefully my most proud thing will be we can check in in a, in a year or so uh, because uh, I think some of the stuff that I'm doing, there's a lot happening on internet governance right. at the moment, which is not to sound like the IT crowd, but it's like the internet. This is the internet, not just ours or yours. It's, it's, uh, it's everyone's. And how do we keep that? How do we keep that from being un, uh, not fragmented? How do we keep this one global secure a private uh, internet uh, together. And I think New Zealand and Australia have a particular role we can play in our region, which is the Australia Pacific region. But it's going to take um, a, a lot of discussion, a lot of understanding that people are what drive the information on the internet and what we accept. You know, we're, we're, we're developing the social contracts for this. Um, and then that then will inform the rules or, or, or those types of things that, and that we don't have to be at the mercy of vendors uh, and vendor led initiatives. Um, so I'm hoping that the thing that I'm most proud of is bringing some of that on ground stuff uh, right. to, uh, to our um, particular spaces and places and um, you know, some of that community led place based community development stuff for uh, you know, uh, an adaptable uh, domestic kind of uh, regional and, and global kind of adaptive um, uh, representation of civil society, which has, you know, I think I said it was a little bleak and it, it is a little bleak. Uh, yeah. you know, Are you and, saying check back in the... In, in I'm the saying, time. gosh, I've really just put myself out there on, on, on my <laughs> panel. So, yeah, <laughs> you can all keep me accountable. <laughs> right. So, so, Kate, what about you? What are you most proud of? Um, well, I'm a, a little bit uh, tentative about saying this one because I think um, there's still a lot of wins that we're still working on getting, but I would probably say the um, facial recognition investigation into Bunnings and Kmart mm -hmm. um, became a very kind of a bit of a watershed moment, I think, in the com in Australia conversation around facial recognition and biometrics. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to certainly give some credit to um, Electronic Frontiers and, um, and also to Digital Rights Watch, who'd been working on facial recognition and the issue of surveillance and the issue of biometric right. surveillance for a number of years. Um, and, you know, just kind of flinging, flinging mud at the wall. And, um, you know, and I think it's certainly a credit, I think, to their hard work and how far they'd they'd gone in that but something in particular um and i probably hopefully a lot of people are familiar in the audience yeah. with that but basically in 2022 choice released an investigation um that found out that our large two of our largest retailers bunnings and kmart um and also the good guys and electronics retailer um were using facial recognition um, in their stores, and most people didn't know about it. So we we had some kind of naturally uh, nationally representative research that said that like seventy five percent of people had no clue that this was happening. Um, so from that, we were able to make a complaint to our privacy regulator here, the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. Um, this is where I think we could still maybe get a win. Is that investigation is ongoing? It's yeah. been nearly two years now, um, yes. and I, I don't want to give them a hard time about it because I know that they are working on it. And I know they get asked about it every single week mm -hmm. um, but certainly um, you know to go to the IAPP um, ANZ summit at the end of last year and everybody talking about that as like we need to be focusing more on biometrics we need to be focusing on facial recognition um, you know I, I'm certainly proud that it's moved the conversation
transition into the public consciousness um, and that it is now something that I, I'm assuming, I don't know for sure, um, but that retailers at least have either stopped doing or are thinking seriously about doing. And I think it's hopefully had a flow on effect to other businesses that they're now thinking differently about taking on that type of technology. Um, I know the situation is quite different. Um, what's happening in New Zealand with foodstuffs taking under the trial and, and certainly um, I know that you're uh, looking very closely at what's happening there. And, you know, and I think, um, you know, we can see what happened there immediately with foodstuffs, that the case of a misidentification of a Maori woman, who, um, you know, must have been incredibly traumatising. Um, and those sorts of harms are something that um, EFA and Digital Rights Watch had been calling out for years. Like, this is a matter of time before this is happening um, here, we certainly have seen it happening overseas. So in that sense, um, you know, I'm proud that we're, we're able to bring that issue to more public consciousness. Um, but I am still really aware of the fact that we don't have proper regulation here mm. in Australia. Um, we don't, we have a long way to go in terms of privacy reform. Um, and we're still waiting on an outcome from that particular complaint. So it's a, it's a mini win. Um, but there's more wins to come. Yeah, and I think, Kat, you addressed this earlier about how we can collaborate. And without the resourced uh, research that, say, Choice does, um, you know, it makes it harder for us to make that case. Um, but it's not just about the biometrics um, gathering from a retailer. It's what they do with it and the implications when law enforcement are able to get some of that um, uh, that that um, footage, and again, when we spoke about privacy adjacent, privacy and these other notions around digital rights are often interconnected um, because when we talk about um, that data gathering or that that just using that thing, that, that footage, um, you combine it with uh, predictive policing and KPIs for police. It, it can be extremely dangerous, um, which we've seen in uh, New South Wales recently um, as well, and certainly in Queensland. Thanks for picking that up. I, I've um, that you've you've actually specifically both of you answered one of the questions that's come in so far, and I'm really conscious that we're our time is running down, so I am going to to. Um, to ask uh, a couple of questions from, from here before we close out. Um, one of the questions that um, was a follow-up to um, issues associated with the use of biometrics to create sort of data security and for other users is, um, what impact do you think the creation and development of deep fakes with the rise of AI has for, um, for privacy um, in particular? Who would like to take that one? Yeah. Uh, well, I think the others probably have more information All on right. how that might uh, impact uh, privacy. But in terms of participation, um, the development of deep fakes and non-consensual um, uh, nudes or pornography has largely been around uh, developing that uh, for women and used against women. Um, and they are usually in, uh, in sites of advocacy. Um, we definitely see that um, in the States uh, a lot. Um, I don't know, I don't know what, um, what statistics it would be, um, but women of color, uh, particularly so people who are speaking up at different levels are often met with I think it's well known that you get, you know, you're going to be met with trolls. You're going to be met with people who are trying to dox you. Um, but then, to have non-consensual pornography made and used as a threat against you to silence you, uh, when we know how many people, uh, how many women, um, uh, and uh, non-binary and queer people have been subjected to this and probably possibly been a victim of uh, sexual assault previously. It's a insidious form of and, and traumatizing form of silencing um, and threatening. So, so for me, there is that level of um, how it can be used in combination with other techniques, but um, also around uh, how, you know, 
we actually have this as a topic for one of our classes and students often talk about how um, interference with democracy because you can deep fake um, President Obama. That is much less likely to impact our elections than using it as a tool to threaten and silence uh, voices of minority people. Right. Other, other views? Catch. Yeah, I'd say that um, broadly, and this is not limited to this particular topic, but technology has an incredible ability to create efficiencies and to accelerate, uh, and in this case, accelerate harm uh, and accelerate violence. So I think this is what we're seeing with this kind of like every production of new technology is a new opportunity to cause harm to marginalized peoples is what we tend to see like a, a, again and again, whether it's defects in artificial intelligence or, um, or whether it's other kind of surveillance technologies, the people that are harmed first tend to be women and people of color. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I broadly tend to encourage people to think of these harms and these um, technologies or to think about digital rights at a, a systemic level um, and encourage when we're thinking about legislation or new types of legislative reforms, uh, thinking about ways that are um, reforms that are tech agnostic uh, rather than trying to patch work together a kind of legislation that will uh, reduce harms for this particular technology but that might not necessarily protect us from new technologies that are that are created tomorrow. Um, that's just that's just why that. But Kiki, you made some excellent points. Kate, yeah, I, I think um, Kat hit the nail on the head there in terms of scale. So I think what AI is particularly introducing is scale. So I think um, this is particularly a message for our Australian government at the moment is that like the internet didn't invent sexism and it didn't invent racism, but it absolutely has, and AI has the capability of scaling those problems. I think we need to understand what, what are problems that we have in society that can be exacerbated by um, technologies um, and specific technologies and that then introduce or scale further harms. But I think we need to be careful of not creating the technology to be the cause mm -hmm. of those societal problems. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's like a really important distinction and it's a bit of nuance that we're sometimes missing in these debates that we get quite caught up in the, the deep fake pornography being the problem when in fact uh, the, the problem is the, the culture um, that is creating that that as a desirable thing for some people to do to try and manipulate and, and harm people. And those harms exist both online and, and offline. But certainly AI has that scale. Um, I just want to pick up something in that earlier question too about biometrics um, and the difference between biometrics for identity verification right. and the potential usefulness of that, for example, regarding um, a, a well-designed, a privacy by design um, digital ID system, for example, that could prevent some of the harms from some of those large, large data breaches, for example, with Optus and Medibank and mean that business, large businesses don't need to retain the same level of, of um and, you know, that's clearly to, of benefit to people. And the difference between that and what we're talking about when we're talking really about biometric surveillance systems. So mm -hmm. that's where I would compare a facial recognition system in a crowd-based system that's using a database of apparently known offenders, none of which of us have any oversight of in the case of the retail example. Um, that to me should be compared more to other types of surveillance. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that I kind of try and frequently say is that surveillance is not safety, like knowing that you can identify a previous offender does absolutely nothing to prevent future unknown offenders or future harms from occurring. Um, and then often we're conflating these two ideas that being able to see everyone that everyone does somehow prevents harms. Um, and again, it's not allowing us to have that nuanced conversation about like, what are the societal problems here that are being um, ex exacerbated by technologies, rather than just trying to think about like, what is the technological solution um, to what's ultimately a social problem? Yeah. Um, there's such, oh, we could be here all night. <laughs> I'm, uh, and uh, the, the, the issues, the, the issues that are uh, brewing in the, um, the digital space at the moment, as you, as I think you've all said, um, 
AI, for example, it, it exacerbates risks that were already there. It just puts them on steroids and, and it actually means that we've got to take particular account of them and, and really advocate in the space, I think, particularly strongly for and sometimes what are actually your basic privacy protections. Um, are going to take you a long way. I'm really conscious that we're almost at the end of our time. We've actually got about five minutes left to go. And um, and uh, as we wrap up, um, I'm really conscious of the fact that I've got a whole lot of questions here which actually go to using your expert knowledge to, to, <laughs> to, to tackle particular issues. But I want to come back to the issue du jour, which was about being an advocate. Um, and so I just want to ask you, as we leave this conversation, which has just been so rich, um, what would you say to someone who is listening, um, uh, who is interested in becoming an advocate, or, or, or even starting a, a very small advocacy organisation? What would you say to them um, to, to encourage them into this space? I'm going to start with you, Kate. You think I'll get in trouble for using the Nike slogan without their permission? Just do it. That's the um, that's the message. Um, is you know start wherever you can. I think is you know start where you are and start with what you feel comfortable with. Um, and hopefully I've given a couple of suggestions of ways that you can support advocacy without necessarily needing to step into the spotlight yourself. I realise not everybody um likes being the big mouth um, in the room. <laughs> um, but there are certainly like ways. Um, even just sharing your story. Um, with an advocate can sometimes be really helpful. Like the power of a case study, and in fact, the Kmart and Bunnings investigation came out of um, a personal story. So, for example, it was a choice uh, staff member who works in our campaigns team went to a family barbecue. Um, his sister-in-law said, oh, hey, I went into Kmart and I tried to return something. And they said, oh, I just need to check the facial recognition cameras to make sure that you didn't steal it. And they went, what? And oh. then, of course, you know, my colleague at Choice went, what? And mm. then it told me and I went, what? You know, and then that was kind of got the ball rolling into um, what it has now become and now an, an investigation from the privacy regulator. So I think, um, you know, you don't need to it's think, us. oh, I need to get all of the credentials, you just need to care um, and you just need to start thinking about the issues and then find some way to to start that. And, you know, and there'll be lots of those things that never snowball into something big, um, but you just don't know what they are, you know, so you've just got to start start where you are. Kat, what about you? Yeah, I, I think that's such a, a good point. You don't need to be a, a loose unit you know, with a big mouth, although it doesn't hurt. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I think Kate really nailed it. Lean into your strengths um, there. If you are the kind of advocate that speaks on panels and at conferences, then it does help to have a kind of dogged determinism or uh, I've been mostly called stubborn. I don't know what the difference is, but um, it, you don't need to be that kind of person. You can be a lawyer or a privacy professional that looks over uh, campaign material or legislative submissions. Um, you can be a security expert that helps your friends and families secure their local network and you know, lock down their phones and help people understand what the news is telling us if there is a, a data breach uh, or several data breaches uh, that affect your friends and family then understanding what that means and, and how we can protect each other I think it's really just about like understanding what is important to you and what your unique skills are and then leaning into those uh, that's that's my that's my suggestion yeah. and and you Kiki yeah look um really I, I don't look I think I think one is is choose your battles first of all um, because as Kat said before you you know you can burn out if you come in too hard just just come in slowly um, if you're considering starting an organisation I would ask why and I think that it is great to have diversity in advocacy organisations to make sure that uh, lots of different views are represented. Um, and so you get also get um, a little more strength in numbers, but starting an organisation does require certain uh, 
Attribute. governance responsibilities and whatever time you thought you would spend advocating is going to be also tied up in in that type of stuff um so you might think i would probably say you know reach out to some of your existing places so i know you've got like privacy new zealand yeah. uh viv uh at internet new zealand is a long time uh i think uh community advocate um you know, ask uh, ask how you can help or um, ask if they can help you. You know, if you have an idea for a project or, or something that you'd like to do, you don't need to start a whole organisation, um, but also not just tearing you if you, if you would like, if that's, if that's your bag. Okay. Um, but be committed to what you put forward if you want to participate. So if you can do a small ad hoc type uh, thing like can you can you run a zoom can you moderate a zoom for us can you send out some things um that's that that is so helpful uh you don't need to know policy to read policy documents because you can guarantee that the people who do are terrible at grammar uh, <laughs> and just need someone to proofread and tidy things up and get it ready to ship um but if you're committed to longer term things that is also fantastic but the important thing is to be self-aware um, because you know with inductions with people putting time into you into helping you do that um, you know life happens to everyone and that's fine but um, try not to overcommit yourself um, and start with small steps and you'll get small wins and you'll find a community and you will be connected yeah. um, but I guess to finish I guess I have one little weird thing that Kate made me just think of they're not my family origins but they this family this Australian Chinese family came around the same time as my uh my family so I'm fifth generation born Chinese Australian and there's a famous Adelaide uh family so Mrs. So Sim Chun and her daughter Dorothy who were leaving uh, Australia to go home we had what was called the dictation test back then that you could had to come back and be subjected to any of the European languages of which no one passed so you could apply for an exemption uh, and so I have this little certificate from a customs and excise office that I love um, where the senior boarding inspector who was basically saying I know them and they're fine uh, here I'm stamping for them for their exemption says that we informed her that uh, she was informed that it would be advisable to have her left and right thumb impressions on the certificate of exemption to save her any trouble should she require to land at any other port in the Commonwealth. But she stated that she certainly objected to having her thumbprints taken and did not anticipate any trouble whatever as she was well known in Sydney and Melbourne. And I love that little uh, act of advocacy from the past of saying well I'm okay thank you for saying that you might just take my fingerprints because it will make it easier for me uh, but I'm sure I will be fine I'm quite well known um, so those small acts of um, resistance that don't have to be and I'm, I mean I you know I'm a neurodivergent uh, half Chinese woman in Australia I have a big mouth and and I'm a loose unit now but I certainly wasn't um you know previously um I I certainly didn't have any of that I had history behind me uh but it was the Chinese merchants who also objected to the use of biometrics in Australia and you can read about that in the history of Australian passports um and I think that might go to one of your Q&A things it is yeah just to be careful of that nation state type of narrative to get things through. Um, you know, start and remain thinking about your community and the many communities around the world yeah. um, and see those patterns and it all becomes uh, fairly consistent um, and, and just, just stay people centered. That, that's probably my, my thoughts on that. Right. Thanks so much, Kiki. Um, unfortunately, as I said, we could go on all night, but I'm going to have to wrap things up now. So um, can I just say thank you so much to you, um, Wahine Tō, as I said, to you, um, powerful woman of the advocacy world in Australia. Um, thank you so much for joining us over here. I'm really hoping that your, um, your messages have inspired people to really take up some advocacy in whatever way works for them um, here in New Zealand. So Nā mihi mahana kia koutou katoa, um, 
thank you to everybody and I'm just going to close us out. Thank you and goodbye.